starting and I will start giving a talk. So welcome everybody. So today I was promising to give you a, some results on uh, moduli spaces and gluing theorems, but first we need to finish the proof of, uh, the, uh, of, the, of Poincaré conjecture in dimensions six and more. Uh, because we just gathered most of the tools that are needed, but we didn't uh, um, dotted the t dotted t's and cross uh, dotted i's and uh, crossed t's. So let me just <clears throat> start. So theorem: if M is simply connected. Dim M is greater than five. <clears throat> um, and uh, um, H star of M is equal of H star to S of the corresponding dimension. Then M is homeomorphic to S of this dimension. Okay, so there is a variant of this theorem. If W is an n dimensional manifold with boundary V0, V1. V0, V1, n is greater than 5. H star of W, V0 is equal to H star of W, V1. And pi 1 of W is 0. Then W is homeomorphic to, uh, actually here it's diffeomorphic, to V0 cross 0, 1. <clears throat> so this condition is called the condition H cobordism. Let's call it H cobordism. H that it is <clears throat> being a bound, being a manifold that bounds a disjoint sum of two manifolds means that W is a cobordism between V0 and V1. And this condition means it's a H cobordism. So this is an extra condition. And then this is the product. So these two theorems are tightly related. We will prove this one. If you go to Milner, Milner's book, Milner gives the proof of the more slightly more general one. But the techniques are the same, except for uh, you have a, homo a closed manifold in here, and here you have a manifold with boundary. So you use for this you use. Uh, a more smale width and chain complex. And for this, uh, you, uh, you use analogous construction, which we didn't do. So that's why we focus more on that. And while I'm saying about more width and chain complex, more, uh, this chain complex is the theorem that homology of the chain complex is equal to the singular homology is actually proved in Milner's book. So. I read Milner's book several times, but I didn't pay attention to that fact. But there is a proof of the of the, the theorem in Milner's H. Coburn's book, mm. Mm. and mm, probably this theorem was uh, well known to Smale. So Smale is the author of this. of this theorem. So, okay, so let me just start proving this theorem. So this is the subject for at least part of the talk of today. So, proof. Well, our proof is try to go, try to simplify a Morse function. So take a Morse function on 
um, take a Morse function on M, so F M to R, any Morse function, and then try to simplify it over and over to make sure that it has precisely one minimum and one maximum. Oh, uh, and so, um, uh, and so, uh, and so that, and so we re invoke the result that was uh, proved during the classes. So we want to simplify. First, first step, choose F to be self indexing. That is critical points of F are all of of index k are at level set k so level set k or level set f inverse of k uh, so this is like first step and this is well this is what we already done so this is like checked second step make sure that there is precisely one local minimum and one local maximum and this is already what we did during classes we did it once so the second step is already checked is checked and the third step is well, we write, before I start, then tell you what is the first step, I, I will tell you what is the fourth step, and I will explain to you why the third step is needed. So in the fourth step, we write down the chain complex, Morse main width and chain complex, and then we try to uh, show that it is, well, a cyclic accepting dimension uh, uh, in degrees uh, zero and n, so we can uh, find pairs of critical points that are by the basis theorem. We can find pairs of critical points. Uh, and Martin, I will explain or re recall what the basis theorem is later on. And then we can cancel them by using Whitney trick and simplify the function. So this will be the fourth step. But then uh, the Whitney trick required had this requirement that doesn't allow you to cancel pairs of one to critical points. So if you have a critical point of index one and critical point of index two, uh, and they are connected by several trajectories, but that the signed count of these trajectories is equal to plus or minus one, then you cannot play the Whitney trick because the dimension is too small. So that was the, the assumption that something uh, couldn't have too large dimension. Let me just show you on the, in the lecture notes from the last classes. Uh, where is this assumption? Well, actually it was only for B less than F inverse of C minus two, but okay. So this was the assumption that we couldn't use the Whitney trick to make to cancel critical points of index one and two. And canceling, getting rid of critical points of index one is important because we want the level sets to be simply connected. So you look at level sets, the Whitney trick is played on the level sets and you want level sets to be simply connected. But if you pass above critical points of index one, the level sets are not simply connected because you just index one critical points just create loops all right so that's what we already did on cl during classes as well so we need to get rid of critical points of index two third step ah, this should be first step and this is the step that we didn't discuss it before I just announced it, get rid of critical points of index one. And here is a trick. 
So the first, the, this step will take like next 20 minutes of our talk or maybe even more. Uh, so about third step idea is the idea is uh, completely different than for the zero index critical points you well you would like to say well okay we have an index one critical point we have index two we have a pair we just uh, do something with that pair no it doesn't work uh, or at least uh, Milner uh, didn't work it out that's uh, which basically means the same uh, mm, so idea trade critical points of index one for critical points of index three. So, okay, so that's idea. More precisely, introduce so first we spoil the, the function and then we uh, and then we will uh, uh, first we spoil the function and then we repair it so it's like um, uh, twice what usual governments do they do the first step and then they stop but we will continue so uh, more precisely, uh, first introduce a pair of critical points of index two and three in such a way that we can cancel the resulting pair of one two critical points so in in the picture like we could have and the rota this picture will sound familiar to you we have trajectories from index one, two, three. And if we have if you have a situation like this, we can all we can either cancel this pair of critical points or this pair of critical points. So we will instead of we will create from for a critical point of index one, we will create a, a pair of two free uh, index two and three critical points and then uh, we will cancel the one two critical points so we are left over with the index three critical point so that's what we will do and uh, i don't know why this picture reminds me of uh, uh, plumbing calculus for surface singularities but it's probably not that related but the idea is similar okay so more precisely so how do we start First, uh, we need, well, we, of course, we need to be careful. So if, if we need to introduce the critical point of index two, we need to make sure that it forms a canceling pair with the critical point of index one. So let me call it M one half. Here we have F inverse of three over two. F inverse of five over two. Okay, and we have critical points, so we have level sets, and maybe this, these critical points will be should be drawn like this, and maybe like that. And of course, below the level set, F inverse of how. Uh, of half below that we have just precisely one critical point so this is uh, this is s um, n minus one and is dimension of m if you work with this 
H cooperative theorem, then this is not S and minus one, but it's a simple uh, connected and simply connected manifold. So it's um, almost like almost like uh, almost like S and minus one for our perspective. Okay. So what we we start with an index one critical point over here. So we have the unstable manifold, which is uh, these guys form Sn minus 2. Sn minus 2 is a co-dimension 1 subspace in the level set. Okay, This guy has dimension m3 over half, so dim m3 over half is n minus 1, and the co-dimension of this sphere M three over half, uh, M three over half is equal to one. So on the picture, the situation looks like I will keep the picture over here. So we have M three over half. And we have the sphere. So this is co-dimension one. So I take a choose any point on the sphere, and I choose an arc and this arc is uh, uh, this arc is uh, it's just a Piece of a piece of an arc crossing S and minus one transversely. So this is like a beginning of our uh, stable manifold, essentially beginning of the stable manifold of the index two critical point we are about to introduce. And uh, this arc, well, index two critical points have the stable manifold that is a sphere that intersects with the level set as a sphere as, as a circle S one. So we need to complete this arc in such a way that it doesn't intersect any of stable manifolds of the critical point. So what we do, we have like two points over here, which are endpoints. So maybe these points should be magenta, which are endpoints. We flow it. so. If we say, well, we have a more smale vector field, so we flow it by the vector field, back to this level set. Okay, and once we once we have flown it, well, they are these endpoints are not on the stable manifold on the unstable manifold of any critical point of index one, because we ju they just. They are just away. So the flow of Xi, <clears throat> Xi is the vector field, Xi radiant light. So the flow of Xi takes these two points back to the level set M half. Well, that's, <coughs> that's what we do. And now these two points this space is connected because we have only one critical, we have uh, no we have precisely one critical point of index zero. So this one handle, none of one handle makes two disconnected things connected. Because that's what we got in the written step in the second step. All right, so these points are in the same connected component of M half because there is only one connected component. So over on M half, we can always connect them by an arc gamma. And now we connect them, but we want to connect them in such a way that they don't intersect any of the stable manifolds of this, because we want to then to flow gamma back to this level set. Mm. All right, so what is what is 
uh, what is the the reason that it cannot does, doesn't intersect so it's the first place where we use the dimension assumption so uh, maybe i we resume recording so uh, we have what happened what is happening on m m1 half so we have these two endpoints the purple endpoints these purple endpoints we have an arc gamma but we have also the stable manifolds of index one critical points but index one critical points intersect level sets stable manifolds of index at pairs of points that's what is index one critical point index one critical point has stable manifold of dimension one and it just intersects a uh, level set along s0 so since dimension of m1 half is greater than one so this is where we use that n is greater or equal than two we can choose gamma so as to avoid stable manifolds of index one critical points. But then we come back to that picture, we have gamma, we flow this gamma back to here. So we have a loop, which we call gamma, capital gamma, which is a circle over here <clears throat> that intersects our SN minus one in precisely one point. Okay, so this is not the end of the story. So let me just, this picture will be important in the uh, why does the, uh, can you please repeat why we have the circle that intersects uh, S and minus one in, in, pre in precisely one point? Oh, because we start with this red arc, yes? We take the endpoints and this red arc intersects this uh, S and minus one in precisely one point. Ah. Okay. okay. And then we cap it by the, by the part from here that leads that closes the arc from the other side. Mm -hmm. Okay, this, thanks. Okay. So thanks. I, mm, well, copied it, but it didn't work. Okay, maybe I should do it once again. Okay, so here we are. And now I have the cycle gamma in here. And I can put gamma as, as dimension as n is greater than three. we can make, by the same argument as above, we can make gamma disjoint from mm, in the, from stable manifolds of index two critical points. Okay, so we can flow gamma to the level set M half. So I call it gamma again. And why do I flow it to this level set? Well, the reason I want to work on over this level set is that this level set is simply connected. So claim
m5 over half is simply connected. And I think I will leave it as a homework. Uh, probably it's uh, mm, uh, it's basically what we did or almost did. If it's not simply connected, then higher critical points will cre will not kill any loop that is appear that has appeared. So from the simple con uh, if m the whole of m is simply connected, then after we pass through one and two handles, everything is simply connected. All right, so this is, uh, this is something that I leave, uh, leave as an exercise. Uh, I have a question because uh, to, uh, let's say, to propagate the um, endpoints, we used our Morse mail vector field and yeah. this is right. Yeah. And uh, where did we, because, and we have some arbitrary Morse function on the manifold, right? Yeah. And, uh, and, and the question is, where did we get the vector field from? Is it just arbitrary? Uh, uh, arbitrary gradient like vector field for, for the function. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so m5 over 2 is simply connected. And then the next part of the third step of the proof is that I want to create on a nearby level set, I want to create a canceling pair of critical points. So I want to spoil the function. Spoil the function f. So next step is next half step or semi step is spoiling the function i.e. introducing pair a pair of critical points so this is a fairly general procedure like you have a function you can introduce a pair of critical points basically out of nowhere and uh, Milner gives a recipe for that but actually for this part I prefer as a reference the paper of Cerf uh, in uh, Iches uh, it's I think 1970 uh, the subsection on uh, uh, the key part, the, the paper is in French, chemin élémentaire de naissance, uh, that elementary path of birth. Uh, Self also uses uh, elementary path of death, and uh, I like the connection of the sound of it with Indiana Jones movies. Uh, mm, so, but this is a slightly better and slightly more precise uh, approach. The key point is that I don't give you a pinpoint reference for that for that paper because the references to that paper are, well, the numeration of sections and subsections is a bit dubious in that paper. So it's basically better to look, to find the PDF file and uh, check up the uh, uh, the part the way you read. So it's not intuitive to give, if I give you chapter five, uh, sec section three, four, five, two, much harder to find. Okay, so what do we do? We start with an auxiliary function, which I call B, like birth, of x1, xn, and just uh, uh, copy it from my minus x, or I will call it b tau with subscript tau, k square plus x k plus one square plus 
x and minus one square, and now x and cube minus two tau minus one. Let's put epsilon x n where epsilon is a parameter and tau is in zero one. Okay, I use it in my previous uh, recent paper and um, Mm. Mm. Uh, and so, mm. and I just found a mistake in that paper. So, uh, and not one in this part. So, that's uh, that's a pity. It's not very good to copy paper parts from this from the paper you write because you find uh, find mistakes. Okay. So and so this is what is happening with that function. So this function depends on the parameter tau, and for tau equal to zero, the function has no critical points. So this is like, the, this part is like, uh, for making it multidimensional, this part is something that we need to understand. So how do you understand it? Well, let me draw a graph of the function. If uh, tau is zero, tau is zero, then this is like x and three, x and cube minus plus x one. So this is a function that plus x n. So this is the function that looks like uh, I'm not very, very good at drawing cubic functions, but let me draw it. For tau equal one half, we have this. Tau equal tau less than one half. It's like this. Uh, tau greater than one half. Okay. So this tells you that this point or that points are critical points of this one variable function. And then if you combine it with this part, you get function that is. Uh, uh, Mm, that is a uh, mm, 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 that is uh, sorry. Uh, you get a function that is uh, 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 that has two critical that has two precisely two critical points. That is an uh, and variable function. So you start with something that has no no variables. So then you have a criti a non morse critical point over here. And then you have two critical points. And of course, you can view it as uh, from different perspectives. So if you are an expert in dynamical systems, you view it as a saddle node bifurcation, which I already explained to you. Or if you are a singularity theory expert, you view it as a, a bifurcation diagram of a D4, sorry, of an A2 singularity So in here. But the key point is, uh, no matter how you look at it, you introduce a pair of critical points. OK, so let me just, uh, and this epsilon is a parameter that I will discuss in a moment. Um, so let me just improve on this function slightly, because this function well depends on the parameter tau, not only locally, but also globally. And I would like to have a function that is uh, somehow injected into my Morse function so that I want to, and for that purpose, I want to control it to have it fixed on the boundary. So, so fixed, uh, fi sorry, not on the boundary, fixed away from a small circle, small ball in Rn. So what is the, the function? Well, introduce a bump function omega from R n to R supported on U, where U is some ball in R n. So we do it locally. So first we we are not we are abstracting from the function. The, the function will appear uh, mm, uh, later later on. So some ball b ball in R n. Uh, 
equal to one. Sorry, so maybe let me be more precise. Zero one equal to one in a neighborhood of zero. Okay, so this is like a standard function, and then we define v tau omega of x1 xn equal minus 1x square minus h a square xk square plus hk plus 1 square plus h and square uh, h and minus 1 square plus h minus and now 2 tau minus 1 epsilon omega xn so here I introduce the parameter. Uh, sorry, uh, 2 tau, uh, it's wrong, it should be 2 tau omega minus 1 epsilon xn. So what is happening, if I introduce here this parameter omega, then my function will be equal to p tau omega is equal to p tau close to zero and p tau omega is equal to p zero away from u. Okay, that is what we are doing here. And now remark, p tau omega has the same crits as B tau if epsilon is sufficiently small. Okay, so we do slightly the opposite. So we first, I first introduced epsilon and now I introduce omega, but then I, I adjust epsilon to omega. And this is like something that you would like to check or probably don't want to check that, uh, well, hmm. <clears throat> What can go wrong here is that, well, if omega is equal to one, then of course the critical points are the same. If omega is equal to zero, then there are no critical points. So the key part is in this, the key part of this homework or something that you have on you and you have a subset omega is equal to one, the key, pro the key problem is um, in this yellow region. So this is a place where you have to be careful and show that there are no critical, that if epsilon is sufficiently small, there are no critical points of this p tau omega function in this, in this region. How, and how you do it? Well, you first look at the derivatives of omega and the, these derivatives of omega are finite. Okay, so they, are, they may be large because your set u can be very, very small. So omega, but you don't care. They are, they are bounded. They are bounded uh, on, on the whole of Rn. And then you see, well, if you are away from this, from this set, then the derivatives of this guy, so derivatives of b tau are bounded away from zero. And you can get, get some. You can get some bound. So that if you define, like, for example, the length of the group. I mean, the derivatives are bounded. I mean, for example, the length of the gradient, which is quite a good bound for it. And then you see, okay, if I take epsilon sufficiently small, then the length of the gradient of epsilon omega will be very very small in this region, will be very very small when compared to the length of the gradient of b tau. And then I've, I can say, well, okay, if my original function didn't have, a, didn't have critical points, then this length of the gradient of the two by triangle inequality can be, uh, is positive. So that gives you the fact that there are no critical points. Um, in that region. And of course you can do your calculations in, uh, in the way you, prefer the most. So the point is that we have like a deformation of a function of a B0 function 
or a path starting from the B0 function that is supported in the set U. So away of U, the path, the path is constant. And this path introduces the, a critical point on uh, a critical point uh, on omega. I'm sorry, uh, on Rn. So a pair of critical points, and this k is a parameter, and you can you probably have guessed that to this path introduces a pair of critical points, one of index k, one of index k plus one. So just for our purpose, you just uh, set k equal to two. Okay. So now the last part is to inject inject beta omega. Can you repeat why we get uh, two new critical points from such a device? Well, for that, is it clear for you that this function acquires two critical points? Two critical points? Ah, uh, yes. Okay, so then we, when you perturb it, you you just you just want to make sure that these critical points sit in here. Okay, yeah, and uh, perturbing doesn't change critical points. Okay, right. Thanks. Maybe you need to restrict to a path uh, the path uh, so that these two critical points do not go out of this region where omega is one. So instead of going up back up to with tau up to one, you go up to tau equal one half plus plus something. But it really doesn't matter. This is like a, a very technical detail. Uh, uh, so what I do is I want to use first implicit function theorem. So I first define a diffeomorphism psi from Rn to Rn, which is given psi of x1 xn is equal to x1 xn minus 1 b0 of x1 xn. So now, what is B0 composed with Psi inverse? So this is a, a diffeomorphism. You can check that this by the by theorem of local diffeomorphism because B0 by the definition has not vanishing the derivative with respect to Xn. Okay, so X derivative of Xn of B0 is just, is just this. So B0 with respect to Xn behaves like this, like Xn, Xn cubed plus Xn. So the derivative is not zero. So this is a, a, a local diffeomorphism. Actually, it's a global diffeomorphism in, if you look at it carefully. So what is B0 composed with Psi inverse? Well, any guesses? What is this function? Okay, if you didn't guess, let me give you uh, it's equal to Xn. All right, so this is like if you pass from this to via inverse of psi and then you compose with a B0, then you just, you're just, uh, mm, then you just, uh, the composition just singles out the last variable of this function. Okay, so now we define define a path which I will call B tilde tau omega to be B, B tau omega composed with psi inverse. And then B is X N. Okay, and this path introduces when B takes a neighborhood. Oh, sorry. 
uh, is equal to p uh, is equal to sorry is equal to x n away from an open subset open and bounded subset v of R n. Why the subset V is bounded? Any ideas? Why we can introduce, so B0 was defined to be equal to, so beta was, beta omega, this guy, was defined to be equal to B0 away from an open subset from an, from an open ball U in Rn. So why is it true that B0 omega is uh, away from uh, some ball V in Rn, bounded? Is it obvious if we take any psi, any possible psi that any psi that it will be true? Well, one guess, but it's it just a guess. Uh, would be that it might have some something to do with the fact that the bound functions have compact support. Not yet, because bound bound function where well, yes, bound function have compact support means that u is bounded, but there is something more in it. Something that we need to check, and I didn't check, and uh, but I don't want to put it under the rider. Uh, there, there are too many things under the rider right now. Okay, so let me just give you an answer. Psi is a proper map. It mount, bounds bounded sets to bounded sets. So B0 is a proper function. So this map is proper. And properness means that you map and its inverse is proper, that you map compact sets to compact sets. If it's not proper, then the pre-image can be, uh, the pre-image of the inverse can be unbounded. Or Psi, uh, psi actually is, uh, since we do it Psi, we mean just Psi is, Psi is a bounded function. So, so you need to just say one sentence that Psi inverse takes compact sets to compact sets. Okay. I'm going to explain one thing is because we first we write that b zero to v tilde is equals to x n and then we repeat it, uh, but with, with this, the claim that only away from a subset. So because there is a, because there is a typo. It's b tau of omega for all tau. And how are we actually why noticing that psi is proper? I mean, the, the, so that's the trick for uh, in this case. Well, because you have, you have here, you have, we have. Yo, psi. Uh, uh, V. Well, actually, it's uh, it's simpler a bit. It's a bit simpler. So we know that b zero b sorry b tau equal uh, b tau omega equal b zero in the whole of the green part, and we know that B tilde tau omega is equal B tilde zero equal X n minus one in the whole of the, of this part, okay? Okay, thanks. All right, so that's the point. So now we come back to our, uh, uh, to our manifold M. 
look at a point on the level set, choose any point, Z, on the level set M, let's say, top uh, 2 plus 3 over 4. Okay, so we are past, we have like M 2 plus 1 half, we have here M 3 plus 1 half, so we are but we have like m 2 plus 3 over 4. So before we pass, before we have index 3 critical points, but after we had index 2 critical points. Two, these are index 3 critical points. And we chose a point z. And now there is a statement that there are There exists a neighborhood uh, W in M of in M, not in a level set, but in the whole of M of Z with with local coordinates. Mm. let's say y1 up to yn such that f restricted to w is equal yn. Okay, is it clear or do you need this is the same essentially the same operation at, as in here. So what do you do? Anybody wants to hear the proof of that fact? I have a question to the statement. F is, it, it's, is our Morse function or? Yes, F is our Morse function, yes. Okay. The, the Morse function that is going to be spoiled. Okay, sketch of proof. Choose any coordinate neighborhood of uh, V tilde of Z with coordinates y1 tilde, y, y1 tilde. And then we have uh, uh, well, at least for one of the, uh, for at least, one index i okay for otherwise if this is not if this is not the case we know that z is a critical point of f but since we know that z is not a critical point of f at least one the, the, one of the derivatives is uh, non zero so without loss of generality suppose df over dy and tilde of z is non-zero, shrinking f if, uh, shrinking w if needed. Leads to, sorry, we can assume that, we can assume 
that. Mm. Uh, tf over tyn has fixed sign on w and now we define psi yn to y1 yn minus 1 yn And so, sorry, uh, or we just say, just define, or maybe I will be a bit more, a bit quicker. Define y1 equal y1 tilde, yn minus one equal yn tilde, and minus one tilde, yn equal f of y1, yn. So this is a base change. In these coordinates, the function f is equal yn. The, and this, is, this gives you a, uh, this gives you a local diffeomorphism uh, that uh, changes one coordinate system to the other. So if you shrink w tilde to w, this is a local diffeomorphism on some w containing z. And this is the reason why this is the same argument as we have in here. Okay, this is the same argument involving implicit function theorem. So implicit function theorem is used for that purpose and not for checking if uh, something given by a set of three equations and two inequalities happens to be a manifold, <laughs> as you were probably used to, more used to that kind of problems. This is like the standard use of standard usage of the implicit function theorem. Okay, so the, this proves the claim. And now what does it, what is, this I am on, now I am on M, I have Z, I have W, so over here I have a map over local chart with coordinates y1, yn. So this is like some set u in Rn. And my function f is equal to y1, yn. Okay, so what do I do? Now it's adjust now if we now we inject inject our function beta tilde beta omega we inject it in here so adjust omega so that it's supported in u in this u this particular u I use this the same u as before for per, on purpose, so adjust it, and epsilon as above to construct a path f tau equal to f away from w and b tau omega in. W. A beta omega in W by identifying this part and that part. Okay, so there is one thing I want to control. I want to control, so my function f one half plus some delta has two crits. I want to, I still want to control the gradient like vector field.
vector field for let me call it this f tilde for f tilde so what do we do we just take slightly small slightly larger Or slightly smaller that is uh, basically your uh, the matter of taste neighborhood w0 bump function uh, phi from m to 0 1 on w uh, on equal to one on W zero away from W zero and Xi tilde a gradient like vector field for F tilde on W zero. So we add, we take any gradient like vector field for our for our uh, for our new function over here and then we do the fantastic thing that we, which you can do about gradient like vector fields we define xi tilde uh, sorry maybe i should call it this xi xi naught to be equal to uh, phi psi naught plus one minus phi psi so that away from this set my new gradient like vector field has the same is the same as my old gradient like vector field okay so that i spoil my vector my function or my gradient like vector field in the neighborhood of z but i keep control over both the function and the gradient like vector field away from a small neighborhood of, uh, of z okay that i want to have because i insisted before i insisted that i have this sphere this circle that in that it intersects my ascending sphere uh, of uh, this one critical point precisely at one point so if i spoil my vector field too much if i take a run now a random vector field i have to start over but i just take okay i have a uh, I have a, something that is good in here, but I spoil my function over here. So let's see what is the situation. Uh, maybe I, I need to copy the picture again. And I need to uh, update the picture for the situation. And now I need to enlarge this picture. Oh, I don't, I won't enlarge it, okay. So I, or maybe I can enlarge it. Okay, so what is the situation? I have here F inverse of uh, three by four plus two. I have my critical point Z. And then, lo and behold, what is going on? I spoiled my, I introduce a pair of critical points. So, index two and index three critical points. And over here, I have a stable manifold of the index two critical point and some trajectories and so on. But the key point is that I have here a sphere, S1, at the level set well F say F inverse of two plus uh, uh, two over three. And I have another sphere that is uh, at this, uh, or maybe maybe I can also flow this sphere so I have here my sphere gamma and I have here my sphere 
maybe not that color. I have here another sphere that is the stable manifold. Let me call it gamma prime. Gamma prime is the stable manifold. But now I have like two spheres inside of this manifold and they have no reason to be the same. There's no reason why gamma should be equal to gamma prime. Well, gamma is one sphere, gamma prime is another sphere. But then we have like abstractly, we have two embeddings S1 into F inverse of five over two. And now the dimension of M five over two is greater than four. That's our assumption. And now any two, imbe any two embeddings of S1, this is like Whitney theorem, any two embeddings of S1 into, M, into a four dimensional space are isotopic. So I can find an, a homotopy or an isotopy that takes one sphere, one sphere to another. They are not equal, but they can be made by, but they are isotopic. So what I do, yeah, so there's no... Are, so are we using some theorem from the previous lecture at this point? Not yet. This is like a, this is a theorem that uh, two embeddings of S1 into four dimensional space are isotopic. This is a variant of Whitney's embedding theorem. Uh, so uh, uh, this is this uh, theorem that any abstract manifold can be embedded in, uh, in no. our end. Well, no, there is a, Whitney theorem is something, so, well, this is this what you said is a bit uh, weaker than the general statement. So general statement of Whitney, of Whitney is that any manifold, any map from a manifold to a, of dimension n to a 2n dimensional manifold mm -hmm. can be perturbed to be, uh, to be an embedding. And if the dimension is larger, so the threshold dimension for for one dimensional spaces is uh, four, then any two embeddings are isotopic, true embeddings. Mm -hmm. And that's what okay. we use here, okay? So, so I understand that this is something that we don't prove, that we just yes. accept. This is like Whitney theorem. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. We can prove it, uh, well, I can prove it using more theory. But uh, it's like another five lectures, probably. Maybe the next five lectures. But um, okay, so uh, so I can I have an isotopy that of this space that takes S one to, to one of these spheres to, to another, and I inject this isotopy by isotopy injection theorem over here so that these two critical points, these two circles match. So I, in this last stage, I um, essentially close, I essentially match the two circles by changing the vector field psi. So Martin, you asked at the beginning, what do we do? How do we choose our gradient like vector field? First approximation is we choose it randomly, but then we improve on it in such a way that in here, it injects precisely the isotopy that takes gamma to gamma prime. And so in the new, with the new, with this new vector field, well, it doesn't change anything before. This is, this gamma over here is the stable manifold of this critical point, index two critical point that we have created. And then uh, we pass it over here. And I forgot one, one thing to say. I said we, we use Whitney theorem, but Whitney theorem says that any two homotopic embeddings are isotopic. Uh, and uh, uh, they are homotopic because uh, this space is simply connected. So we use the fact that this is simply connected space. If they are not simply connected, then there is an abstraction. They can represent two different homotopy classes. If we have two circles that represent two different homotopy classes, then no matter how you try, you won't make, you won't 
find an isotopy between them. But anyway, we have a, we have created a, an index two critical point in the index three, and this index two critical point has precisely one trajectory from index one to index two critical point. So now we rearrange so we can we are able we are allowed to move this critical point over here and then cancel. We can now cancel the resulting pair of two, three critical points. So there is one comment over in here. Uh, so it took me like not 20 minutes, but an hour. Uh, and we do it, of course, with every critical point of index one. So here is an interesting st statement that, well, we really assume we, we don't need to, we don't use Whitney trick yet, but we really assume that the dimension is four. If dimension is three, if, if the dimension of the M, the whole manifold is four, so then we can have like two handles that are non-trivially knotted in, um, uh, in the, on the level set. So there is a way of dealing with this, with this critical. So first of all, it is not known if any simply connected many for manifold uh, admits a function, uh, Morse function with, uh, wait, wait, no, no. I think it's not, not, not known that it's not true that any simply connected four manifold admits a Morse function with uh, no critical point of index one. There are some obstructions and some examples where you can, can prove that there has to be an index one critical point. Uh, I think it's in Marco Gola's paper. Uh, I won't check if he's on chat now. But, uh, uh, mm, mm. Uh, so, uh, but uh, there is an, a way of looking at index two and one critical points on four manifolds, which is called Kirby calculus, which is a very geometric way. And the reference for that is GOMP steep siege. Uh, I should write it maybe in one is gomp steep siege and there is a recent book which is probably available online of Selman Agbulut who is a grand master of Kirby calculus but if you say it to him he will be uh, he will be a uh, uh, a bit uh, angry because he is uh, he thinks he's a more four dimensional uh, geometrist mm. but in fact this person is uh, uh, like mastered the kirby calculus and count of handles on one and two handles to a uh, to a level that is beyond human imagination so he is he's like uh, Robert Mess, uh, so uh, Leo Messi of uh, four dimensional geometry in that aspect. Uh, so, mm, mm. Uh, so this is like the end of step, end of step three. So where we are, let me, mm, let me recall, we have a function f from m to r, self indexing without index one grids. So all level sets, all non-critical level sets are simply connected. So now we do the procedure, we, we pass to step four, four canceling critical points. Uh, and canceling is uh, using the, the, the approach that I sketched during last lecture. 
So we have a chain complex CN, Morse smell with a chain complex CN minus one goes to goes to C2, goes to C0, goes to zero, because there is no um, uh, there is no uh, um, there are no critical points of index one. So this is a zero map. And now we have C2 has a basis, let's say C21, C2K. So this is, the, the complex is acyclic. So homology, second homology is zero, okay? Second homology is zero, so this complex is acyclic in this part. In particular, this map from C3, let me just write C3 over here, from C3 to C2 is surjective. So there is a, there are elements C31, C3K in C3 such that the boundary of C3 is 3I is C2I. Okay? And now I look at the subgroup spanned by C31, let's say capital, spanned by C3K is a direct summand of C3, and this is like an exercise, a simple remark in algebra that it's a di direct summand, because if it's not, then you have the map, so we like, can take, extend it to a, um, so if it's not a direct summand, then it's like a multiple of some direct summand. So some, some of the elements are multiple of generators. And then the, this map, since this is surjective, this surjects, then there will be some torsion in homology of C3. So if it's not a direct sum, then it's a homology of C3. In particular, C3 plan up to C3K can be completed to a basis of C3. Okay, so this is uh, like an observation, and now we use use basis theorem to obtain from the from lecture nine to obtain to improve improve actually the frank the vector field psi and maybe the function f. Would be so that C31, C3, S, and C21, C2K are actual, actually represented by the critical points. So we have a basis, but this basis is like, this basis can be like, Originally, this basis can be some linear combination of C1 up to C21 to C2K or C31 to C2N. So this can be like a linear combination of, of one and linear combination of the other. But now we can say, well, we can have we can perform handle slides from last lecture to obtain a, to obtain actually that the, to obtain that this basis that each element of this basis is precisely a class of a singular point. So Martin, that is one of the statement of the of the previous lecture, and uh, I think this is like mm, mm, what I should do over here. 
So in uh, I have one question regarding the, uh, the, thing, the thing that was on the previous page. Uh, can you please repeat why we can, uh, why we know that the sub subgroup uh, spanned by these uh, uh, elements that generate C2 uh, is a direct sum because for modules we don't always have a direct complement. Basically, uh, well, this is mm. this is a this is a free group, free abelian group, and surjects with the uh, uh, and the kernel. So okay, so you have C3, okay. So in C3, you have the subgroup that is kernel of C3 and the image of C4, sorry, kernel of kernel image of D4, kernel of D3. So, um, uh, I would say that the image of D4, so this is so the kernel is a uh, the kernel is a direct summand, okay? The kernel of a map is a direct summand uh, is a direct summand. If I'm not saying any very stupid thing, because I need to cook up the. Let's consider Z four and multiplication by two. Then Z Z four doesn't split. But if we knew that C two is projective. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, uh, no, 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 not that. This follow. This doesn't follow from from projectivity. This follows from the fact that the kernel. Okay, the kernel of the three is a direct summand, and then the the kernel of the three is a direct summand. So we can write C three is kernel of the three plus some subsets C three tilde. And why is the kernel a direct summand? Uh, Here. Okay, can we discuss it during classes? Because yes. it's uh, sure. because it's uh, uh, we can start with it. Because it's uh, mm, I don't want to want to say something very stupid, and I want but I and I want to compute uh, co to conclude the proof. So in particular, the C three i is equal to c to i so there the count of trajectories trajectories from c3 i to c to i is plus one by so the count of trajectories which is like the we have we can have like from this critical point C3i to C2i, you can have many trajectories, but they come with signs. Each trajectory comes with signs plus or minus. And the total, the signed count, so those with sign plus and those with sign minus are in total, are, are to, those with sign plus are counted positive. This at, uh, with sign count minus are subtracted. So, so the difference is plus one, that's a homological statement. And now by Whitney trick, we have we can alter Xi in such a way that there is a single trajectory from C three I to C two I. So we can can cancel this pair without affecting other critical points, and then we move for move on and on and on uh, until we have cancelled. We repeat the procedure until we've cancelled all crits of index 2. And now we pass to in critical points of index 3.
and so on. Alright, so once we have cancelled, we pass to index three critical points and so on and so on. And in the end of the day, we just say, okay, this is what we did. So this is the end of the proof of Smail theorem and moduli spaces will come uh, next year. So that's all for the lecture and we will resume at 10.15 with classes and start with the classes with this uh, algebraic question. Uh, I have one question regarding to, to the finishing of this, uh, the, 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 the way we concluded, because now we don't have any um, index one critical points, but uh, then we still have some kind of higher index critical points. And for the lemma from the classes to work, we need to have precisely one minimum, precisely one maximum. Uh, wait, wait, we have like, this is one dimensional, this is one dimensional, this we cancel. And then we, once we got rid of that, we start, we, we work with this, and then we cancel this until we arrive at the situation where only these two remain. And then we cancel, we can, can, we can cancel this. And then eventually okay. we, we end up with CN and CN is just one generator. If you are afraid of why can we cancel these critical points? Well, if you are in dimension more than, uh, uh, how much, uh, five, in dimension, if n is greater than five, we can play, play the same game as in the step three to trade index cn minus one critical points for index cn minus three critical points. So if n, sorry, if n is greater than, than five, then you can get rid of critical points of this index as well. If that helps you, but we already mm -hmm. assume that n is greater than five. Actually, so you can get rid of these critical points as well. Anyway, this is like, the conclusion. Any other so question? We, we just claim that we are uh, getting rid of, rid of the higher uh, level, uh, higher index critical points in a completely analogous way to the uh, index way. Two, to index two critical points, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank so you. This is like, this is like the, the version of induction that I start with C2 and say, well, next are done the same, but I could start, assume that we have canceled all and we have we passed to induction step to be more formal, but I think it's okay. So I think it's the same. Are there other questions? If no, so we resume at 1015.